Water vapour is the most abundant greenhouse gas. It's essential to keep the Earth's surface warm enough for the habitability of the Earth. It's also a reminder of how water vapour interacts with radiation, particularly infrared radiation. And it's an element that we can research in places like Mauna Loa, where at the top of the volcano in Hawaii, we can measure atmospheric water vapour and also the isotopic ratios of water vapour to help us understand the greenhouse effect and climate change in response to external forcing. So one of the things that's unique about uh, Mauna Loa is being high altitude, we can make these measurements of water vapour isotope ratios. If we look at this figure here, we see a, a several week period indicating ups and downs of the meteorology, which is controlling the isotope ratios, in this case deuterium. Over this period, we see day-to-day -day variations as well as the weather systems uh, coming through the region. So although these measurements themselves are of great scientific value, they offer us another way to think about the role of radiation and water interacting in terms of the measurements themselves. If we think about water and what water is, of course the molecule, H2O, well, the structure itself, it can do many things. It can vibrate, it can rotate, and it can move translationally in one of three directions. In terms of the rotations and vibrations, there are particular frequencies that are excited uh, and the molecules themselves vibrate and rotate with certain frequencies. We can make these molecules move by allowing them to absorb radiation of particular frequencies. Now, of course, for water itself, these are quite distinct, but if the water molecule has an isotopic substitution, the geometry of the molecule changes, and so too the frequencies which with they rotate and vibrate will also shift slightly. We can exploit this uh, in terms of a measurement capacity. So let's think about how light moves through the atmosphere and then an atmosphere with water vapour in it. Imagine we have a light source of some particular uh, frequency. And if there's nothing in the atmosphere, the light will simply be transmitted and there'll be a complete transmission of the light. We can try light of a slightly different frequency or colour. And again, if there's nothing there, uh, it'll simply be transmitted. If we now have water vapour in our atmosphere, it may be absorbed. And in fact, we know that at a particular frequency, because of its rotation and vibrational characteristics, there will be certain wavelengths of light which will be absorbed as absorption. So we can continue on this path and we can make a graph of the transmission fraction versus the frequency that 100% transmission or less. So if we consider now another molecule, let's try HDO, and if we expose it to the original light, perhaps it's not excited by those particular frequencies and so the transmission is still high, 100% or nearabouts. But there will be other places in the spectrum where both HDO and H2ATNO are absorbing. So we can now start to build up a graph showing the transmission fraction as a function of frequency or a transmission spectrum, the reverse of which is what we call an absorption spectrum. So instruments can be designed to do this and lasers are often used to tune the frequency of light so that there's absorption at different points along the spectrum. In one example we see here that there's a relatively narrow range of the wavelength space where many of the isotopes, the stable isotopologues of water, can be observed uh, by looking at the absorption feature features. Importantly, the amount of absorption is associated with the number of molecules of that particular isotopolog. So by measuring the spectrum, we can then infer the isotope amount, the isotopolog amount, and ultimately the isotope ratios. So absorption is great, but of course there's emission as well. If we have a molecule at any temperature, there will be emission of light at a particular frequency. Again, that frequency is associated with the rotation vibrational characteristics of that molecule. So if we have a different molecule, the wavelength of light that's emitted will be slightly different. Instruments can be designed to measure the emission spectrum just as we have instruments that can measure the absorption spectrum. A great place to look for the emission of radiation from Earth is from space. Here we have a picture of the NASA or a spacecraft which has an instrument on board which can measure the emission spectrum and an example spectrum is shown here where the purple features are indicating emission features that are associated with HDO molecules. By comparing the HDO emission to the emission from other gases, particularly H2O, regular water, the isotope ratio can be derived and ultimately the satellite can obtain estimates of the isotope ratio as profiles as it orbits in this figure from south to north along an orbit track. Once these data can be compiled, global maps can be constructed and the Aura spacecraft can make global maps of HDO isotope ratios every two days, we obtain a new spatial perspective on the distribution of isotope ratios in the atmosphere, in this case the mid-troposphere.
That allows us to think about our scientific questions regarding the greenhouse effect and the global warming influence in places like Hawaii where we're interested in using isotope ratios in untangling the complexity of the hydrologic cycle between atmospheric circulation, cloud processes and the interactions with radiation. Thanks.